So the second transformation that we have to go through when we are waking up from Jehovah's Witnesses is the transformation of your identity. See, I wrote this book called Fear to Freedom. Many of you wrote, uh, read this. And this is how I titled my chapter. It's a book with many authors. Uh, but my story starts like this. What's better out there? That's the title of my chapter. How loss of identity became the biggest gain of freedom. The first quote is, The strongest force in human psychology is to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. I'll repeat this because it's actually extremely important. The strongest force in human psychology is to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. I heard it from Tony Robbins the first time, and I'm like, man, this is really powerful. And the reason why this is so powerful is because for Jehovah's Witnesses especially, that was not something we did on Sunday. That was, that was every decision we have ever made, the, from the smallest to the biggest. Because if you have an identity as strong as Jehovah's Witnesses, then whatever decision that you make will be intertwined with it. The car you're going to buy, the person you're going to marry, the school you're going to choose to, the place where you're going to live, everything is from the perspective of how this decision will help me to be a better witness. So you could say, oh yeah, I have many identities, like I'm a father, I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a friend. But to be honest, that identity was always intertwined with Jehovah's Witnesses. So if you are choosing to be a husband by marrying a, a, a woman, then what happens is you are trying to figure out the best role as a husband that is defined by Jehovah's Witnesses. Because as a husband, you are the head of the household your wife's supposed to be in submission to you and you are providing a spiritual headship on uh, on on onto your family on your wife and the kids when you are a father you have to raise those kids as jehovah's witnesses if they are staying in the organization that means you've done a good job as a father and you, the list list goes on and on and when you are so attached to that identity of who you are as a person it's so difficult to give it up because especially for those who were raised in it there's nothing outside everything outside was always evil <laughs> to say the least and now you don't know who you are not only you're losing all your friends and family and whoever was a Jehovah's witness when they're disfellowship you or when you disassociate yourself or even when you fade you know the shining will happen sooner or later but you don't know who you are, so you're losing yourself. And you felt like, if this is not true, then what is? Then what's the purpose of life? What's the purpose of me living here? I remember I had those thoughts. I had those thoughts of, there's no point of anything. It's not that simple as, oh, don't worry, you're just going to pick up the pieces and keep on going. No, this goes so much deeper. This is why some of the psychiatrists out there, they have no idea how to handle this because... They don't understand how deep it goes. You don't want to go to church? Don't go to church. Big deal. You don't want to be part of a team? Don't go. To, like A month from now, you're going to be fine. They don't get it. That it almost every decision we have ever made, especially those who were raised as witnesses, was made from that perspective. When you were a child, you knew exactly what to do, what not to do. If they told you, oh, we're going to draw a Christmas tree, you knew your your identity. You were a Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses did not draw Christmas trees or Halloween pumpkins or whatever it was. Because the, you knew your, your identity. See, the thing is, if you know your identity, if you know who you are, you know where you came from, you know where you are and where you're going, it's actually very easy to make decisions because they align with your identity or they don't align with your identity. You know who you are and if somebody approaches you and says, okay, I want to make you a deal. We're going to do business together and the business is amazing. They're going to make a lot of money and so on and on. If you are a Jehovah's Witness, a very strong believer, the first question is, will this deal interfere with my service to Jehovah or the organization? Is it going to interfere with the meetings? Is it going to interfere with my service or my study or whatever it is? And if the answer is yes, most witnesses will be like, mm. it's very difficult for them to, to justify giving up um, 
service of giving up uh, meetings for a business deal because that's who you are as a person. But here's what I believe. I believe that we didn't really lose an identity. We lost the identity they gave us. We didn't lose ourselves because our identity is still there. It's still inside. It's still in our core. It has been just squished with a whole bunch of rules and a whole bunch of fears of who you have to be in order to be accepted and what kind of punishments you're going to have to face if you are yourself. That was the key. Because if you want to be yourself and maybe you had certain desires and dreams of how you want to express yourself even, you had to squish it down including all your successes of who you are as a person and what you did, you had to squish it down because you could only talk freely about what's happening in the organization when it comes to positive things and negative things that are happening in the world. I've seen people who, even as Jehovah's Witnesses, they, 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 they really succeeded. And I was so happy for them. In my own family, I heard that my brother-in-law got a promotion and I went, I'm like, I'm so happy for him. I went to congratulate him and I'm congratulating him in front of everybody. And he's like, <gasps> no, 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 shh, shh, shh. I, don't, I don't want people to know. I'm like, why not? It's a, it's a happy occasion, right? Like we should celebrate. I know you've been waiting for it for a while and, and your dream came true. Like what, what's wrong with it? Like, no, no, we got it. Because it looks materialistic when you're happy that you got a promotion at work. I'm like, come on, seriously? It's not like you're giving up meetings or, or something for it. You, you're, you should celebrate for this. So it, it is challenging if you attach everything to this one aspect of your life and religion and everything that you chose. Now you're going back in your mind and you're thinking, oh my gosh, if this is not right, if this is not true, how many decision, decisions that I had in, in the past I would have made totally different. Maybe maybe you wouldn't even marry the person that you're with right now. Because you were attracted to them based on their spirituality or their or their status in the congregation. And as a young person, you're like, mm, the, the the marriage basically was a license for sex. And very quickly you realize you're two different people and you have nothing in common except the religion. Now you're stuck. And I've heard that over and over again. This is not something new. I'm very lucky to be with my wife because we have a lot more in common than just a religion. And, and we're very happy together. But I've seen countless couples who, who are complaining about that, that very quickly they realized, oh man, we've made a big mistake. How, there's no way out of this now. At least the consequences of getting out of the relationship are extremely painful. Because we wanted to stay consistent with who we are as people, as Jehovah's Witnesses. All the decisions were made like that. So in one way, having this clear-cut vision of who you are and where you're going, where you've been, and having all the answers provided a, 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 quite a bit of comfort. Quite a bit of, you know what, I know who I am. I know what I do. I know what I don't do. I know what I stand for. They give us certainty. And that certainty felt good. We need certainty in our life, especially about ourselves. When we know who we are, it gives us strength because we know what we're going to accept in our life and what we're going to say, no, I'm not going to accept this. This is unacceptable in my life. It gives us a very clear cut, a path in life that decisions are easy to make. Unfortunately, when you wake up from this, you realize the majority of these decisions were not yours. Somebody else made them for you. And now you get to choose your identity. You get to choose who you want to be. You get to choose your values, your beliefs, and what you want to do in life and the rules you're going to follow. And it's not that easy because it's like rebuilding from scratch. When somebody else gives you the identity, it's like a house that you rent. Somebody else build it and you can't change it. You're just accepting the fact that you're moving in. Somebody else did all the work and you're comfortable in it. But if you want to move a wall, mm, it belongs to the landlord. It is not yours. Now you got evicted from it or you left and there is no other house for you to live in. That's your emotional house. Emotional home is not there. Your, your values, your beliefs, your rules, they're all gone. 
and you got to rebuild it from scratch. And I tell you, very few, very few people have that strength to rebuild it as nice as it was before based on their own terms. When you go and build your own house, you got to build it from scratch. You got to first get rid of the dirt and then pour the concrete for, for your footings and then the foundations and then the walls and then the, and then the roof. And then you got to finish it all inside before you start decorating. That's what, <laughs> that's what it is when you do physical home. But believe me, your emotional home is exactly the same way. Exactly the same. The beauty about it is that you decide how you want to live your life. There is nothing better in life than owning it. When you own your life, you know that you're living a life on your terms. There's nothing better than that. If somebody will ask you, what did you replace it with? Oh, you, you, you've been a witness for all this time. And then what did you replace it with? You can look them straight in the eyes and say, I have a life on my terms. And it's better than any type of life where you have to rely on somebody else to tell you who you are and what to do and what not to do. Life on your terms is worth the sacrifice. I know at the beginning is not easy. It's like being kicked out of a rental place and you don't have your own home. It takes time to build it. But if you build it yourself, instead of jumping over to somebody else's home again, like many people do, they just jump to another church or another cult, and they, they go from one, one abusive relationship to another abusive relationship because that's all what they know. And they don't believe in themselves thinking, I can build this on my own. I can choose for myself what I believe in and what I don't. When it comes to identity, forget the idea that you have only one. Forget that. Because that's what Jehovah's Witnesses told you, that you only have one identity and this one identity will just answer all your questions. If you have problems with your wife or your husband or spouse, whatever, don't worry, we have an answer. Every Jehovah Witness resolves their, their issues with more prayer, more Bible study, more meeting attendance, more personal study, and, <clears throat> and more reading of their books. That was the answer for every single problem there was. It was very narrow-minded and many people couldn't possibly say, oh, you know what? I followed your advice. I did what you asked me to do and it didn't work. I remember when one brother actually said that. He says, listen, we have problems in our marriage and, and we went to the elders and we asked the elders to help us and they told us, read the Bible, prepare for the meetings, go to service and all this, those things that they always say. And we did that. And it didn't work. It's supposed to work. It didn't work. What should I do now? <laughs> of course it didn't work. Those things don't help you to be a better husband or a better wife. They help you to become a better witness. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a better husband. But they gave us this one answer for everything. Be a better witness and everything else will be fine. Right? It's like... Look out for God's kingdom first and then everything else will be added to you. That idea, it's spread among witnesses like I, we have an answer for everything. Don't worry. If you're dying, don't worry about it because you're going to be resurrected. If you're sick, you're going to be resurrected. There was an answer for everything. So being a witness was really deep into our subconscious mind. Now that you're leaving this, remember couple of things number one you have more than one purpose you have more than one purpose and you get to decide what the purpose is it's not that you don't have a purpose in life you get to decide what purpose you want to live it's up to you now it's not up to them first they gave you this new personality they said you got to put on the new personality which basically meant we're telling you what to do what not to do what's acceptable what's not acceptable who's gonna be your friend who's not gonna be a friend and so on and on because they put that personality on people and they require that 24 7 and no longer people feel like oh i don't know who i am because that's the only thing that they knew especially if they were born in it but when you leave you get to choose and you realize that every time you say the word i am whatever you put behind can determine your purpose if you say i am a father for example then my purpose every time i'm with my kids 
changes than if I'm with my wife. Because for those kids, I am their father, I am their provider, I am their protector. I play with them, I train them, I teach them, I have fun with them. That's what father does. But then I can go to another room and then I'm seeing my wife and to my wife, I'm, I might be providing for her, but I'm not going to be training her like I train my kids. I'm not going to be disciplining my wife like I discipline my kids because I'm a different person to my wife. All of a sudden, my purpose changes depending on who's standing in front of me. I hope you get this because it will help you to understand that you have multiple purposes in life and multiple identities, not just one. And for that person, whoever is standing in front of you, you should be the best person you possibly be. So if you are a father, you should be the best father for your kids and constantly trying to think how you can improve being a father for those kids. So their life is better. So you can improve the quality of life for yourself and for your kids by becoming a better father. And then you switch. The moment you switch with the person standing next to you, it's like, there's your wife. You should be the best husband to your wife and improve the quality of her life by you being in it. Then you're going to go to work and then you're going to be an employer or employee. Either one, you got to think who you're dealing with and how you can make that life better, that part of your life better. Because that's part of your identity. Now you're going to come back and before you go to home, you're going to see your neighbor. Now you are a neighbor to the guy who lives next to you. You should be the best neighbor that you possibly can be. And the identity will change every time you switch from I am a husband, a brother, a cousin, a neighbor, a friend, an employee, an entrepreneur, a driver, whatever it is after that, it switches. But I tell you what, we're always looking for like, you don't understand, Jack. We, we, I, I need clarity. There's, there's way too much confusion. I need like one purpose in my life. And I thought about it for a long time. Is there such a thing as a one purpose for all of us, all humanity and every single person on the planet? And I think there is. And the beauty about it is it really, when you tap into it, it makes us really fulfilled. Not just happy, but truly fulfilled. What is it? I believe that it's the purpose of our life is to improve the quality of life for ourselves and others. The moment we see that the life improves, the quality of life gets better because we were here and we can make that impact on other people and we see that their life is better because of us, then we truly feel fulfilled. It's not just a, a short joy. It's truly fulfillment inside. If we see that through our actions, somebody else's life is getting worse, it's the opposite effect. We can even get depressed because we feel like we're useless or worse less, worse yet. we causing damage and harm to others and people don't want us in their life. And this is the feeling that we had when people cut us off from Jehovah's Witnesses because they treat us as cancer. They treat us as we are damage or a potential danger to their faith and their relationship with Jehovah. So they need to cut themselves off, even though maybe we were not even trying. We were not trying to wake them up. We were not trying to talk to them, but they just got scared of us having a different opinion. I've seen it many times. But you know what? Sometimes you got to cut off certain good things in life in order to be great. Because if you hold on to the things that JWs teach you and to those relationships and to those friends, there's no way for you to grow. There's just no room. And at the beginning, it's painful because you think oh, you have this community and there's so much loss. Well, guess what? Unless you lose this part of your life, there is no room for you to grow, to have better friends, to have deeper relationships, to have more purposes in life. Where you know that you have this one goal to improve the quality of life, but then you get to choose how you're going to do it. And you can have multiple of ways. And guess what? You're not married to your purpose. If you decide, I don't know, you decide to be a plumber and you're going to help people to fix their plumbing. 
or created in their homes. And then 10 years later, you decide, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this. This is not my calling. And then you feel like I want to be a totally a different career. I want to be, I don't know, electrician or I want to be, I want to open up my own gym or I want to buy a store, or become an entrepreneur or, or open websites, whatever it is. You decide to sh shift the career. That's fine, too. Because you feel more compelled towards doing something. Very often, we feel like there is something inside of us that says, I want to go this direction. This is what I want to do in life. But we couldn't make money out of this. And then we settled to do something else that maybe we disliked even doing. We don't like doing that. It was not our passion. But it paid the bills. And we got stuck with it for a very long time. Guess what? You're not married to your purpose. If you don't like something in your life, change it. Don't blame other people. Don't blame your parents, the system, the government, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and so on and on. Don't, if you don't like something, change it. It's in your power. There are so many people who went to school in their careers when they're in their 60s. <laughs> I recently became a pilot. I'm super happy about it because it was my dream to become a pilot. But there was a guy who was 73 years old in my class. 73. Isn't that crazy? 73-year-old guy. And he's like, nah, I waited. Couldn't afford it before. Now I'm doing it in my retirement. 73 years old. I'm so happy to see that. I mean, it brings so much joy to me. Because I see that people have the capacity and, and the drive to follow their dream no matter what their age. As long as you're breathing there is still a chance. There's still hope that you can do something. Remember that. There is more than one purpose in your life. You can improve the quality of life for yourself and for other people, and you get to choose how you're going to do this, and fulfillment will find you. Don't ever give in to this idea of, oh, if there is no paradise, and if I'm not an elder, if I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, if I'm not a pioneer, if I'm not a minister or servant, that I'm nobody. The opposite is true. You had to lose all those titles and you had to lose that community and you had to close that book in order to live your full potential. And even if you don't find it right away in a year or two, don't stop. Don't stop. You have time. Keep trying. Keep pushing. Eventually, you'll find it. And I'll tell you right now, you're going to find it the moment time disappears. You'll be like, what? What are you talking about? See, there's something magical about finding your true calling. It's like when you do something that inside you feel like, yeah, I love this. What happens is the time disappears. You can do this for a very long time and you don't get tired. And every time you look at the clock, you're like, it felt like 15 minutes and I've been doing this for an hour. Like, what? <laughs> Because it's your true calling and you love doing it. That's how you know. And you, it energizes you. You feel this energy. There's something inside that feels like that's what I want to do. Uh, it, it's, it's incredible. That's one of the things that will show you. And if, if you're doing a certain activity and the clock seems like it's going backwards, you're like, there's no way. I felt like an hour, but we only worked for this like 15 minutes. That's not your calling. That's, that's a signal from your nervous system saying, look for something else. Somebody else will enjoy this. You should look for something else. If you're dragging your feet to work, if you hate what you're doing, if you don't like your life, change it. There is something else that you are good at, that you can give a gift to this world by listening to your calling. Even if you do it part-time, even if you do it after work, even if you do it on the weekends, but don't squish it down because that's what Jehovah's Witnesses were always telling you. Don't worry. Whatever talent you have, whatever calling that you have, whatever it is that you want to do, you're going to do it in the new system. Right? You're going to be a, 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 I don't know, violinist or you're going to be a singer. You're going to be doing whatever it is that you want to do. Push it for the new system. Well, guess what? The time is the only thing that you have that you will never get it back. The time that you, the clock is ticking and, and 
if you don't use the time wisely, you will never get it back. We have a moment when we're born. We have a moment when we're going to die. Between this point and this point, there is a dash. Some of it is already gone. But you have whatever time left. Use it wisely. You will never get it back. And I'm telling you, if you use the time to improve the quality of life for yourself and others, when you see that other people's life is better because you were here, your life will be fulfilled. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.